Praise the Lord. Amen. You know, when you, when you pray and you ask the Lord to do something, there may be two things that happen. If you ask for prayer in your life, prayer of faith can produce an immediate healing. And I've seen that take place in my life many, many times. I've seen things that have boggled my mind, and I had to look twice and say, did that really happen? And it also might be the case where as you pray, the Lord asks you to stand in faith. We're going to need to mute everything that's up here except for me and Leslie. And the prayer of faith may say, I want you to go and just as Jesus, or just as the prophet Elijah sent Naaman to go, to go bathe in the, in the Jordan River, when you go and you act in faith and you have to stand on that faith, your healing comes. And so it's faith, faith is what issues the whole thing. Faith initiates it, whether you're standing in this, in this room this morning and you were prayed for, or whether you're out there tomorrow and you start facing and feeling those symptoms. Okay, let's, let's, let's be real. If you feel a symptom coming on, all you have to do is just say, Jesus, I know that I have sta- I'm standing in faith here. You don't deny the reality. You confront the reality. And you confront it with faith. You confront that with the reality of faith. And so we stand as people of God in faith, no matter where, where when we pray, God immediately hears us. He, he, he immediately hears us every time. But whether his, what, whether his healing comes immediately or whether it comes as a process, we stand in faith the whole way through. We walk in faith. Because God's people walk in faith by, and not by sight. You can't please the Lord unless you walk in faith. That's it. That's, faith is what pleases the Lord. And so I just encourage you, be people of faith. Stand in faith. No matter what it, what it is what, that you're facing, no matter what sickness, whenever you have sickness come in your body, you need to begin to speak faith to it. Speak faith. Don't begin to fear and start getting scared and say, oh my God, what's going to happen to me? You rebu- rebuke that doubt from your mind and begin to speak faith and say, Lord, I know what your word says. And this, is, this right here is the best way to speak faith. When you don't know what to say, just begin to quote the word of God. Stand upon the word of God. That's where we stand. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Lord, I just pray that you continue to bless the rest of this day. What a beautiful day that you've given us. I pray that, Lord, that you would bless your word. As I speak, Lord, let, let the anointing of the Holy Spirit come. May you guide my mouth. May you, may you, Lord, from my mouth, Lord, to the hearer's ears, Lord, may it be anointed with the, with the Holy Spirit. And I pray that, God, that you would do the work that you have wanted to do Lord, and that you have consecrated for us to, to, to see today in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want you to take your Bibles. I want you to look with me in the book of Luke, chapter 1. Dealing with this disease, this sickness that we've, we've all had to of some measure deal with we we even deal with it today in some shape or form this year has been a quite a substantially um, different year than most others would you agree how many of you have had some plans that you had made maybe last year or early this year and your plans have completely changed or they got changed if you're if you didn't raise your hand or you're not shaking your head you're not telling the truth there are, there are, every person in this room, you had plans that you had made. I know that, that many people had plans. We had plans in our family. We, you know, um, things that just didn't happen that were supposed to happen. That we planned on in January, February, early March. Things that were supposed to happen, but they didn't happen. Graduations that didn't happen. Vacations that didn't happen. Marriages, weddings, things that didn't happen. And it wasn't because we weren't planning on them. It was just plans changed. 
plans got messed up. And we, can, we think that we can blame all of the changed plans and the messes that we have de- had to deal with over the last 8 to 9, 10 months on 2020. How many, I've seen, the, I've seen the, even the bumper stickers are coming out now. Just blame it all on 2020. But, but I, what I want you to see this morning is this, is that the truth is, is that God has been messing up people's plans for a very, very long time. Now, don't get me wrong. As just I said, COVID-19 is not something that God threw at us so that we would, you know, get a joy out of watching us deal with this sickness and this disease. It did not come from the Lord. Sickness does not come from God. But what we do know is that God has a way of changing our plans to meet his purposes and through all of this that's what i want you to see and and i'm going to go to the christmas story this morning and i'm going to show you and i'm going to prove to you how god has a very unique way of messing up people's plans i'm I've, my message this morning is titled when god messes up your plans god has messed up my plans more than once i can tell you that absolutely for sure And I know the Lord has probably messed your plans up more than once as well. And in this story we're going to read in Luke chapter 1, you're going to see that God messed up some plans of a young couple and an entire nation. But His plans produced a Savior that we can call upon in the midst of our plans being messed up. Luke chapter 1 verse 26 says this, In the sixth month, Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. They were engaged. They were, they were making plans. How many of you can remember far enough back to the day that you got engaged? Those of you who are young right now and you, you're young, you haven't been married very long, you can remember those engagement times. Those of you that's not married, there's that engagement period where, where uh, you know, you're you're, it's solid. You're making plans. I remember when Shannon was making the plans, and I was like, they was like, do you want this? Want that? You want it? Th- what, what color do you see? I was like, look, no. You just make all those plans. My plan is just to show up that day. That's all. That's the plan I've got. She was engaged to be married to this man named Joseph, a descendant of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son. Talk about a shocker. And you are to give him the name Jesus, and he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. when I read this story, I just I, I get the sense of this angel who's telling this, this young virgin girl her life is about to be upturned upside down. But if you'll notice through the Christmas story, the angels, the only thing that they really have on their mind is talking about the baby. They're not worried about Mary and the disruption and the change of plans in her life. God wasn't worried about that. When he sent the angel, all he wants to do, he will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. And then all of a sudden, Mary's like, um, excuse me. Verse 34. How will this be? Mary asked the angel. Since I am a virgin. I mean, I would probably follow up, hey, you're engaged, you're, you're about to get pregnant. I would probably follow up with, um, real quick question, how is that going to happen? And that's exactly what she does. How is this be? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One will be born and He will be called the Son of God. Can you just see it? It all starts back up. And let me just tell you, He's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. Uh, Excuse me. i got a quick quick question here. It's going to affect me quite a bit. I'd just like it really. Just an answer. The angel goes on. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be barren in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. 
At this point, I think Mary just pr- finally just says, you know what, this is too surreal for me to even try to argue with, so I might as well just say, yeah, I'm the Lord's servant. May it be to me just as you have said. And the angel, in my own reading, would, would shake his head and say, and the Bible says, and the angel left. I don't think that there's a couple in the Scripture any more fitting to show the picture of how God messes up people's lives and plans sometimes than Mary and Joseph. I don't think that it's any more obvious how Mary, this young woman, had her life and her plans all totally messed up. I mean, here's, here's the thing. Here's what I want you to see. First, I want you to realize that God messes up everybody's plans. If you're taking notes and those note sheets that we gave you, that's the first thing. God messes up everybody's plans. You see, about nine months before this first Christmas, God intervenes in the human affairs of all of history and he radically changes this young virgin's life. This young girl's life, he totally changes her life. She's planning on being married to Joseph. He's a descendant of King David. I mean, that's a privilege. This guy's got some clout. He's got some prestige. His name matters. At least she thought. He was working in Nazareth. He was a carpenter. So let me tell you, young ladies, if you're looking to marry a guy, make sure he's got a job. Can all the dads in the room say amen? Amen. He's a young carpenter. He lives in Nazareth. In Nazareth, he, he's got a trade. He knows, he, he's got some skills. He knows what to do. He's not a deadbeat. Doesn't play video games all day long and never go to work. I better back up. I better get back to my notes. Matthew says, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 19, says, and he was a good man. I mean, that's exactly what you want your daughter to bring home. He was a good man. The Bible says that he wasn't rich but he would have made a comfortable living. He wasn't wealthy by any stretch of the imagination, but he had a trade. He understood how to do things. He he would have made her a, a, a comfortable living. And so Mary, this young, engaged woman, she's making plans and she's planning the colors and she's getting all the all the, the things that you know that, that young brides prepare for. She's planning to get married. She's thought about having children and raising this family and this just perfect life. She's got it all in her mind of how it's going to after just transpire and this is her plan and this is how it's going to work out. And it was a good plan. It was a comfortable plan. It was a typical, normal Jewish girl's plan. And you look at Joseph. He had the same plan. What did God do? He came and messed up the whole thing. The angel comes. He says, Mary, I know that you're engaged. I know that you have plans. I know that you have a schedule, that you've got a time frame that you're working on. But I have a different idea. So before you get married to Joseph, you're going to get pregnant. And guess what? It's not going to be Joseph's baby. Jaw drop. Joseph's not going to be the father. I am. Now, Talk about having a monkey wrench thrown into a young girl's life. I mean, that's straight out of the 2020 playbook, right? I mean, something just totally wrecks your plans come mid-March. Life is different. Things change. Job situations are different. The country's different. You look at people, people are different. You go to Walmart, Walmart's different. I mean, well, I don't know. Walmart's kind of always been that way. I take that back. It's just different. Can I just say, I went to Walmart on December 1st. It was an experience. I had to run. The staff sent me. The the staff sent me to go pick some things up at Walmart. Who's running this place? I said, I'll go. I'll go. I'll take, take some things at Walmart. It was like taking your life into your own hands. I know, you know, it's December 1st. It's payday for most people. It was like, you know, I needed, I needed security guards around me as I go through there. It was crazy. You know, I guess everybody decided to do their shopping on the same day. Or they heard we were having a staff meeting and I was coming. 
plans were totally wrecked. Talk about a monkey wrench. Matthew tells Joseph this. He says, when Joseph found out that this good little church girl was pregnant, when he found out that this young woman that he had had his eyes on for a long time, when he finds out that she's pregnant and it ain't his, he decided he's going to break this engagement off. And the Bible says he's going to break it off quietly, which means he's going to actually be a good guy. And he found out his, his fiancée was cheating on him. He wasn't going to embarrass her. He wasn't going to post it on social media. He wasn't going to you know, like, you know, do revenge posts and do all this kind of stuff. He wasn't going to do that. What he was going to do is the Bible says he was going to set it aside quietly. He's a good guy. A good guy. I mean, this is an honest, hardworking young man who had plans for his life. I want to have a wife, a true woman that just loves me and who cares about me. I have, I've got plans for children and my family. Maybe we live in Nazareth. Maybe we don't. I don't know where we're going to live. But we, I've just got this great plan, Mary. We're going to have this wonderful life. And then all of a sudden... You're pregnant? This, this throws a change in all of our plans. This messes up everything. And then God messes up Joseph's plans even more. Joseph, you know, he was going to wait to have children. And then he was going to set Mary aside quietly, not, not embarrass her. But God changes both of those plans when an angel from the heaven comes and convinces Joseph that Mary's story is actually true. God messed up everybody's plans that first Christmas. I just wanted to know this. He messed up the shepherd's plans. They just wanted to have a nice, peaceful evening watching their sheep on the nice Judean hillside, just looking up at the stars. And all of a sudden, their plans got wrecked when the whole sky is filled with angels and they're singing songs saying that there's a baby born down the road in a manger. So much for a peaceful night's sleep. So much for a nice little, you know, easy, easy shift. That wasn't easy for those shepherds. Messed up their plans. Messed up Herod's plans. You see, Herod had plans. He wanted to be known as the king of the Jews. This slick politician, this guy wanted to be known as the man who was going to take care of it all. And then he finds out that there was a Messiah that's been born. And what does he do? He sends his footman to go out and to, and to destroy all of the young babies that were under the age of two. Talk about wrecking his political dreams. Not only did it do that, but I want you to think about the families of Bethlehem. Consider this, how their plans got messed up. You've got moms and dads sitting around a table planning college for their kids. And all of a sudden, the door gets broken in by the soldiers of Herod. And they find the youngest in the, in the room and the child that you have that you've been talking about college plans. And they take that child and they murder that child. Talk about messing up a family's future plans, right? Not only was it just the families of Bethlehem, but the entire Jewish nation. I mean, God messed up the plans of the Jews because what were they planning? They were planning for a political Messiah to come and lead them out from underneath the thumb of the Romans. They were hoping to be singing victory. But instead, they were told by this Messiah to turn the other cheek, to go the extra mile. To love their enemies. God messed up everybody's plans that first Christmas. And none more extreme, though, than Mary. He messed up their plans. So if, if you're sitting here in this room and you're thinking that 2020 is a unique situation, can I just tell you it's not? We want to think that we always live in the worst of times. We want to think that it's always worse now. It's always worse upon us because we're in the story i just can tell you right now that through the course of history when it comes to god's purposes he's messed up a lot of people's plans he's messed up a lot of people's plans the bible says in verse 29 that when mary gave was, was received this news that the bible says that she was greatly troubled Greatly troubled. That's the, that, that Greek word is diodoroso, which means that she was, had deep mental and emotional distress. Deep mental and emotional distress. I'll confess to you, this year I have had deep mental and emotional distress. I have been greatly troubled this year. Personally, 
There have been times this year, and I don't know, maybe, maybe you could identify with me here. There's been times this year that when things would happen, when my plans got changed, I mean, for instance, Seth graduated high school this year. And of course, it's high school, and we're going to have graduation, and we're going to do all that. And instead of having a graduation where the whole family's there and we're all sitting in the, you know, in the seats you know, at, at the, the Coliseum at UNT like they always do, and we're watching them as they walk across the stage and all this kind of stuff, we're sitting in a car at Texas Motor Speedway watching a screen. And I thought to myself, this can't be happening. I mean, it sounds kind of, it sounds kind of fun, you know. Hey, let's go to Texas Motor Speedway, sit in the midway or sit in the, in the infield and watch it. It wasn't. It was, it, was, it was surreal. I was like, this cannot be. Ha-. How many times this year, if I were to really ask every person, how many times this year would you say that you have said these words? This cannot be happening. Right? I mean, we've all, we've all said that. I've said it numerous times personally. My response is, I just can't believe this is really, really happening. I cannot believe that they have told churches that they can't open their doors. I can't, that blew my mind when I first heard that. California, I couldn't believe it. Is this really happening? It was surreal. Greatly troubled Diaco Rosso. I was like, whoa, this is mentally distressing. This is emotionally draining. I watched a, a documentary here a while back about the tsunami that came uh, in the Indian Ocean and in 2004. And in a matter of minutes, get this, I mean, it's been eight, nine months. Or so, I heard, you know, 280,000 people have died with COVID. In a matter of minutes, 280,000 people died in the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004. In minutes. didn't take months. Minutes people died. That many... A quarter of a million people died in just a few moments. And as I watch this documentary, I see these people that they documented that they had survived the initial, this wave, where a quarter of a million people died. And they found some of them, and they, were, they found them like on these inland roads, just walking. Their clothes are torn. Some of them don't even, some of them were naked. There were children, they were naked. They didn't even have clothes on. And they're just walking down these roads just like this. You know, it was like, what's that? The Walking Dead show. Is what they, they look like zombies. I mean, they're just walking. If that's what zombies, they were just walking. And people would come up. They said they would come up to these people and they, they, they would just mumble things. They were, so, they were so emotionally and mentally distressed. They didn't know what to do. What happened is they went into shock. And they, they, the question that they were asking was, this cannot be happening. That was the reality. That's what happens. When your body goes into shock, your body is saying, this cannot be happening. And say where they were walking. And it's, it, it's, it's the same way. Sometimes I've seen people that almost look like zombies because their plans have been changed in such an incredible way. And they, they, they can't interact. They don't, they don't engage. God messed up their plans in such an extraordinary way that their response is similar. And, and that's, sometimes that happens to us. Our plans get changed in such a way that we just get so mentally distressed that we, just, we walk around like zombies. You come to church, you're a zombie. Now, I'm not calling any of you zombies. You all look much better than, than you're just your average zombie. But when, when you see that happen... When God messes up everybody's plans, we respond the sim- similar way. And what happens is the next step you see in verse 34, like what I described, Mary says, how can this be since I'm a virgin? After God messes up our plans, the next thing that happens is when, our, is when plans change, God's get, God gets questioned. Who's the first person that answers the question? Who's the first person that we're going to go to? God, what is going on? God, how are you going to fix this? In other words, God, this does not make sense. This does not compute. I need some help here because I can't figure this out. It's a normal response. We question God. We say, God, how can this happen? Why did this happen? How is this going to turn out? What are you going to do to fix this? When is this going to end? When are you going to to resolve this issue? And the angel, as you see in this story, doesn't doesn't even condemn Mary for the question. He's really not too too heavily uh, eager to answer. He's too busy describing the child. 
But he says, he, he doesn't say, hey, look, don't ask questions right now. I'm still talking about this child that you're going to have. He's not offended by that. And I just tell you, God's not offended. When you ask honest questions, when you don't get that promotion that you thought that you were going to get, or when you don't get that job uh, that you thought that you were going to get, or when something happens in your family that you really had planned on happening, but it doesn't ever turn out, or when things just don't go your way, it's okay to talk to God. It's okay to ask God, God, why? God, he, 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 doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't despise those questions. As a matter of fact, as your pastor, can I just tell you this? That when things go wrong in your life, when, when God seems to be messing up all of your plans, the one thing that I encourage you to do more than anything would be to ask questions. And do you know why? Because if you're asking questions, you know what that means? If you're asking questions of God, that means you're praying. You're praying, and if you're praying, then you're communicating to God. And if you're communicating to God, then you're gaining understanding because God's not going to keep silent when you're asking the questions. And if you're gaining understanding of God, then you're growing closer to Him. So I encourage you, it's okay. Ask those questions just like what Mary did. Hey, how is this going to happen? What is going to take place? How is this all going to work out? Just don't shake your head and pretend like nothing has occurred. Go to God and ask Him the questions. And when you do, He's going to explain. And here's what happens. God's explanation is just going to have to do. That's right there in your notes. When God gives you the answer, it's going to have to do. Why can't I go over to their house, Dad? Come on. Because I said. But Dad. Because I said. I may give you more information later, but for now, that's what you need to know. When God messes up your life and you approach him and you ask questions, you need to understand this. God's explanation to you for now is going to have to do. It's going to have to do. It's not for you to keep in line. It's not for you to, to pull back and say, well, God, you're a tyrant. It's for us to accept his explanation at the moment. His explanation to Mary was this in verse 35. He says, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Okay, could I get a little more detail, Lord? You're talking to, uh, I'm just this young virgin. I'm going to be pregnant. Could you explain that overshadowing part? Give me a little more detail here. What, what really is going on? Did you know that theologians have argued for centuries over what that really means and how that exactly took place? And you know what the conclusion they've come to? They haven't. Because the way God explained it, it's just going to have to do. We, we do know that somehow God supernaturally caused Mary to become pregnant. And we do know that somehow that when Mary asked, God answered. And we do know that when we ask God today, that He will answer. He continues to do that. And He says, I want you to ask. As a matter of fact, the answers aren't always what we want. The answers don't always come when we, want, when we think they should. But the answers, but God will be faithful and He will let you know what He wants you to know when He wants you to know it. Trust Him. Don't try to fill in the blanks when you don't have the answers. God's always trying to get through to us. He's trying to get through us through to us all the time. And God speaks to us. He's, he, the problem is not usually on God's end. Well, the problem is never on His end. It's always on our end. Are we listening? Are we tuned in? Are we too busy? Are we too distracted, especially during this time of the year? Are we too busy to see what God is really trying to do? So how's God speaking to you right now? Well, I can tell you how God speaks to you. He may speak to you through His Word. And my question to you is, are you reading it? Don't ask Him to find out what's going on if you don't read His Word. That's as plain as it gets. I mean, what's he doing right now? Well, he may be speaking to you through this message or through Bible study that we have. How often do you attend? Right? Don't ask God to say, hey, give me some answers when you're not listening. 
are putting yourself in a position to listen. Come on, there's a good amen moment right there. I want to make sure that you're tracking with me here. Maybe he speaks through the Holy Spirit. My question is, are you close enough to God to know what the voice of the Holy Spirit sounds like? That's an important factor. So God's explanation is going to have to do, and then as you work through this, you look in verse 38. Finally, Mary just says, look, I am your servant. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. What? That's probably one of the most incredible statements that you'll see in all of Scripture of a person who surrenders to the Lord. May it be just as you have said. She knows what it's going to do to her life. It's going to affect her life. It's going to change the way her plans go. It's going to change her future. It's going to change a lot of things in her life. But she says, may it be just as you have said. There's two options when it comes to when God messes up your life. Are you ready? The two options. If you're taking notes, this is a very important part. The two options are this. You can either submit to it or you can submit to it. When God messes up your plans, you can either submit to it or you can submit to it. But either way, God's plans are going to prevail. We don't get to call all the shots. When something comes along, that messes up our life in such a way, we don't get to decide. God doesn't expect us to know all or to understand all but He expects us to be faithful through it all. So submit to Him. Submit to Him. Allow Him to be in charge, which is what it means to be a Christian. When you become a Christian, that's what, it, that's what you've done. You have taken up the cross of Christ, and you have decided to follow Him. And that's what you do. You submit and you surrender to Him. Can I just challenge you right here how many of us really know the right thing to do but we don't do it i would probably submit that every person in this room has heard more sermons than you're ever willing to follow you've read more scripture than you're ever willing to obey it's usually not the fact of information in our generation content is all around us you can get content anywhere as a matter of fact, that's why a lot of the seats in this room are empty is because you can get content anywhere. But I will tell you this. Obedience is what God requires. Knowledge is not the key. If you want to follow Jesus, it's not about how smart you are and how many Bible verses you know and how many quick Christian cliches that you can throw out there. It's about how well you obey the Word of God. That's the, that's the key test of a true Christian. It's about how, how well you obey. Are you obedient? It's not about knowing the right things. It's about doing the right things. In order to follow Jesus, you must be willing to follow Him. And you must be willing to allow Him to mess up your plans. And that's exactly what Mary said. She's like, look, I am the Lord's servant. Do with me as you see fit. So let me just close. Let me give you some takeaways this morning. First takeaway is this. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. One of my favorite scriptures. This is what the scripture says. Proverbs 19, 21. Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Some of you need to write that in the front of your Bible. Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. The first takeaway is this, is that God's purpose always supersedes your plans. God has the ability to overrule you. He has the ability to override all of your plans, the goals and the dreams and all of these things, because, see, it's not about you and I, it's about Him. 
and it always has been. And so God's purpose is always much greater than our plans. We don't know what God's purpose is. Honestly, I don't know what fully God's purpose is. I think I have some idea of what God's purpose was for 2020 as we wrap this year up. I don't know exactly all of the things that's transpired in 2020, but I do know that 2020 has accomplished the purposes of God, whether my plans were accomplished or not. Because the purposes of God will always supersede my plans. In Job, a man with complete experience, he says this in Job chapter 42, verse 2. He says, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours will be thwarted. God, I know. Look, I've lost my livelihood. I've lost my family. I've lost my home. I've lost my health. God, I know that your purposes are much greater than anything. They can't be stopped. Here, here's the thing. You shouldn't be discouraged about that. The great thing is, if we know God's purpose is always going to be done and it's not going to be thwarted, that means that Satan's best guess and Satan's best attempt and th- Satan's best uh, 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 push against the will and purposes of God will never, ever, ever prevail. That the good and loving God that that you serve, that you know, that you put your faith in, that His will and His purpose for good and for and for and for goodness to your life is going to take place no matter what the the devil says. If you'll just stay following him. Takeaway number two is this: the best response to a messed up plan is to talk to God. The best thing that you can do when your plans go south and when things don't turn out the way that you thought that they would or when you have a 2020 in your life that occurs in the matter of about seven days. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. When 2020 happens in a condensed form and all of a sudden within a few days you have just had everything in your life just totally just kind of displaced and ruined and changed and everything. What's the best response? Talk to it. Talk to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says this in verse 12. We've not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit of who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. We've, been, we've received the spirit of God. You know, the wonderful thing about the Holy Spirit is that John tells us through the words of Jesus that the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will teach you all things. That's an incredible thing. Because The one, I want you to think, the Holy Spirit is God. Okay, He's not like some extra adjunct faculty in the Trinity. He is God. The Holy Spirit. He is God, and God is omnipotent. He is all-knowing. He is is all-powerful. He is all-present. This is who the Holy Spirit is. And He has been given to us to do what? To teach us. Now, I want you to just think about that. That means that the the person who knows all the answers to every question is waiting for you just to ask. How powerful is that? All the answers lay at your fingertips through the word of the Holy Spirit who has come to teach you all things. God, I don't understand what's going on in my life. God, I can't figure out this situation. God, I just don't understand. Just keep talking. The Holy Spirit is going to teach you. In the middle of a messed up life and a messed up world and messed up things, just start talking to God, friends. That's the best thing that you can do. The third takeaway is this. God's explanation always requires a measure of faith. We know that. It always takes faith when you hear God speak. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 again says, Your faith might not rest, your faith not, might not, doesn't rest on men's wisdom but on god's power my my faith does not does not come from the the amount of knowledge that i can gain as i study and read books and try to figure out things my my faith and god's explanation comes because i rely on the power of god i trust him and i trust his ability to take the messed up things that I don't understand, that I can't figure out, that I don't have the wisdom capability of knowing, that I know that His power is capable to keep me in all those things. Mary had to have that. 
she had to know that the power of God, who was able to send an angel in the middle of the night. Now, let me just tell you, I haven't had very many angels visit me in the middle of the night. Matter of fact, I've had none that I know of. I'm not saying that God couldn't send an angel to speak to me. But I'm not expecting just to hear an angel. I just know that I, all I have to do is expect the power of God to stand with my faith. Just like what we prayed here. I expect the power of God to stand in our faith. That's what His Word says. And then finally, the final takeaway is this. It's not my plans, but it's your plans. When you boil everything down, the Proverbs writer says in Proverbs 16.3, he says, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. You say, oh, my plans get to succeed if I commit to the Lord? That's right. That means you commit your plan to the Lord. If you commit it to Him, it will become not your plan. It becomes His plan for you. It's not my plan. The way things have turned out this year, that hasn't been my plan for sure. We had things on tap. The church, we were moving here in this church. God was moving. It was a powerful, mighty just the, the first few months of, of this year, I was like, man, God, you're going to blow the lid off of this place this year. Our staff was feeling that same thing. Well, God, you're fixing to blow the lid off. And surely he did. <laughs> but he has his own way of doing things. Psalm 37, I close with this scripture. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. Anytime God interrupt, interrupts our plans, the only thing that we can realize is that it's because He has a better idea. Mary planned on a normal Jewish life. But God told Mary this in so many words. He said, Mary, I don't want you to just give birth to a kid. I want you to give birth to a king. And that was only going to take place by His power. Mary, I don't want you to just give birth and raise a son. I want you to raise a Savior. Mary, I want to know that you've got a good plan, but I've got a better plan. And in all of those things, the reality is, is that you have to be aware that God's greatest blessings, here's what I want you to, to realize, is that God's greatest blessings come in the midst of our messed up plans. Because that's when you see God working the most. That's when you recognize that it wasn't me. It wasn't my idea. This was all the Lord's. When God messes up your plans, friends, trust Him. God's purposes for this year and for this season, for Christmas, are still on track. And I know that His blessings are going to flow because of it. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for our time that we have had together today, Lord, just to be in your presence, to worship you. I pray that, God, that you'd continue, Lord, to let those who were prayed for and healing, Lord, that they would stand in faith. And that, Lord Jesus, that those, Lord God, who have felt, Lord, just mentally distressed, emotionally distressed because of this year, let them see that, Lord, when you mess up plans, it's so that you can make better ones. Give us faith to trust you, to be obedient to your word, and to guide us. In Jesus' mighty name, may it all be done. And we'll give you glory and honor and praise. Amen.